have been doing for so many decades now. So let's start right from the beginning. And uh, the time around your conception is a good beginning to start. <laughs> when was it approximately? What, my beginning? Your uh, conception, which year was it? 1936. Right, and uh, where was it? It was in uh, what then was called Czechoslovakia. Nowadays it's Slovakia. And it was in the capital of Slovakia, Bratislava. In Bratislava, right. So you are a European in a way. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm very much a European, yes. Good, uh, so, okay. So in Czechoslovakia, Around that year, what was uh, the cultural context? What was it like in uh, in those days at the, that uh, space? Well, in some ways, um, Czechoslovakia was a very liberal democracy after after the First World War. Uh, but in the 1930s, under the influence of Hitler from Germany it became more and more fascist. Uh, Nazis were taking over all over the place. It was really not a good time to be born to a Jewish family. Which means that uh, you are connected with uh, Jews? Yes, I am, yes. So you are a Jewish, a Jew, uh, born in Czechoslovakia, in a very delicate period of time. Yes, and it got worse and worse and worse as time progressed. And so uh, in 1942, mm -hmm. when the Germans started, started to deport Jews to concentration camps, uh, my parents and I escaped to Budapest, Hungary. Mm -hmm. um, on foot in the middle of the night, we went through the border and uh, we went to Budapest. Budapest, Budapest at that time was not, was not, was under the German influence, um, but uh, there were no deportations of Jews from Hungary at that time. So it was the only place that one could go to, you, you, you know, there, there were no exit visas or anything like that possible. Ha Hungary was the only place you could possibly escape to. Uh, and so we did. And uh, then when we arrived in Hungary, of course, we didn't know anybody there. And my parents were looking for a place to stay. And uh, they found a man who was going to help them to find uh, some kind of a room. I mean, we didn't have any money except the money that we took with us. Uh, I was six years old. And this man said that he knows of, of a family that could take care of me for a couple of days while my parents were looking for some kind of an accommodation. And so I was uh, put into this, uh, family of, um, of, of one lady who was a, uh, who was a tailoress. Uh, she, was, she was a dressmaker, uh, had a little shop in her apartment and her husband who worked for the government, uh, he, was, uh, he, he was a low level uh, civil servant. And uh, the first night that I was there, I remember I was lying in the living room between two chairs because they didn't have a couch or a bed for me. They were very poor, very poor people, just, just barely making it sort of. Um, and uh, the husband came by and uh, the lady of the house, Margit Nene, she said to him, uh, this boy uh, is going to stay here for three days. And he said, okay, but no more. No more, three days. And I stayed there for three years. And they took care of me while my parents were in hiding. And uh, so went through all kinds of uh, 
very difficult experiences. Uh, in 1944, at the age of eight, I was caught in school. Uh, one of the kids somehow uh, told on me. Uh, the police came. They took me into jail. Uh, the jail was for old people and children. And I think that the idea was that once they had enough people there, it would make it worth their while to send them, you know, to concentration camps. So, um, but the woman who looked after me, who was not educated, but a very, very smart, smart, you know, street smart kind of a person, she had uh, she had a beautiful 18 year old daughter and the two of them found out i mean how they did that i don't know because you know like why would you want to go to the police and ask where this uh, little jewish boy was right i mean what do you care right i mean that would immediately create suspicion but they did they found out where i was and they came to the prison every day, brought me some of my favorite foods. And uh, the daughter, who I said was very pretty, started flirting with one of the guards. And on the third day, when we were out, when the children and the old people were out in the courtyard, uh, one of the guards called me over. I went over, he took me to a he took me to a little door in the gate of the courtyard, opened the gate, told me to go out. I went out. Margaret Nanny and her daughter were there. They picked me up, took me into a cab, and drove away. Oh, it brings tears to, to my eyes. What a story. Oh, yeah. This, this, woman, this woman was amazing. So by that, do you want me to continue? Oh, yes, please. So uh, this woman was amazing because by that time, of course, she was worried that the police knew about me, right? Like I had a file by this time. So it wasn't safe for me to stay with them. So she found, she found a place for me on a farm far, far away out in the east of Hungary, put me on a train. I went there to this farm several hundred kilometers away out in the east, close to Russia. Um, and there I was on a farm for about three months all by myself. I had no idea what was happening to my parents. Um, I was with these strangers. Uh, they were good to me. I, I, I never suffered. Uh, I was never abused. Um, once I came very close to being discovered, um, I was walking on a side road and another little boy of my own age came along and he said, I know who you are. And I said, yeah. And he said, yeah, you are a Jewish boy escaping from the ghetto of Budapest. Mm. And I thought, well, this is it. I'm found out. But I was like, perfect in Hungarian, absolutely perfect. And I said, what me? Pardon my language, but I said, you fucking bastard. You are probably Jewish. You are just trying to make, make, make yourself safe, you know? The early beginnings of a psychiatric mind here. So, <laughs> so he said, oh, no, 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 no. I was just joking, just joking, no problem. And we became the best of friends. Of course, I never trusted him, but for all intents and purposes, we were good friends. After three months, the front came closer and closer, and I could hear, I could hear guns firing off every night, and there were soldiers all around. And then one day I got, one day an officer of the Hungarian army came with a letter from Margit Neni, the woman who looked after me, and she said, trust this officer. He will bring you back to Budapest as his own son. Learn the names of the son and the mother and everything, and he will bring you back. And so I did. And so we went on this train, and it was full of soldiers, just 
Hungarian soldiers, German soldiers, and me. Uh, I don't know how I got through that, but I did. Uh, I got through that, we came back to Budapest, and then Margit Nedi found me another place in Budapest where I could stay. I mean, this woman was amazing, amazing. And so I stayed with that, with those people, and we went, and then by Christmas of 1944, there was constant bombardment, and we went down into the cellar, and spent about two months in the cellar. But once again, uh, it, it wasn't, I mean, there was tremendous danger all the time because the Germans until the very last moment were looking for Jews to, to kill them. And uh, there was constant danger. But anyway, I survived. And then after the war, Margit Nenny sent somebody over to bring me back to her place. And so I went back to her place, and that was in January of 1945. And then there was no sign of my parents, no sign. I had no idea where they were because they never told me, just in case that I would be tortured, I would not be able to tell. So three weeks passed, and there was no sign of my parents. And I pretty well gave up at that point. And then one day there was a knock on the door of the apartment and I went to the door and they were my parents. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. So then, you know, um, <clears throat> so then uh, eventually we went back to uh, Slovakia. My father was a lawyer, so he started practicing law again, but in 1948, the communists took over Czechoslovakia. And of course, you know, my father being a lawyer, that's bourgeois, and you cannot trust the bourgeois according to the communists. And so we knew that our, our time in Slovakia was, was finished. Like there would be no, they would probably, my father would have to go and work in a factory uh, I would never be allowed to study at university because I was the son of a lawyer. So my parents uh, decided that we would flee to Vienna. And so in 1949, a year later, just with a couple of pieces of luggage, we fled to Vienna once again. And so it was in Vienna. Uh, I did not speak a word of German that we rented a little apartment and there were some books there. And one of the books was Freud's interpretation of dreams. And so with a German Slovak dictionary, I started reading Freud and I just loved it. I just, just loved it. Uh, I uh, took to it, what do they say? Like a duck to water. And uh, it just made a lot of sense to me. And it was a duck. It was at that point that I made up my mind that I would become a psychiatrist. And so eventually three years later in 1952, we were able to come to Canada, to Toronto. And then I studied here high school for, what was it, about two years, I think, yes. And after that, I was able to get into pre-meds and then into medicine. And then, um, I, uh, after my third year, I went to work in a large psychiatric hospital in New York State. And uh, it was a very large hospital at that time, like it had 5,000 patients. And there were only about 26 doctors and pretty well all of them were foreign doctors, uh, mostly from the Philippines actually. And in the morning, they would make rounds and prescribe medications. And in the afternoon, they would study. And so uh, I was told that I could work anywhere I wanted to. And I said that I would like to work in the emergency department where people first came in. And I didn't know anything about psychiatry except that you take a history. And that there, there are three large sort of diseases, you know, schizophrenia, de depression, and anxiety. Uh, that's about, that was the extent of my psychiatric knowledge. Um, 
but I did remember my Freud. And so when I started working in the emergency department, uh, I had a tiny little office and I would ask the new people to come in and I would take a history and then I would see their families and then I would see them again the next day and ask them about their dreams and their childhoods. Well, the word got around that there was a psychiatrist here who actually talked to people because nobody else did. Nobody talked to them. And so there would be these long lineups in front of my office, people wanting to see me. It was wonderful. And so it was at that point that I was sort of reinforced in my desire to become a psychiatrist because I could see that, you know, I was doing some good and that I was really benefiting these people. And the people that I saw, as opposed to the people that the other doctors saw, I mean, my people improved like within weeks. The other people took months and months before they got better. So there was, there was a huge difference. It was like plain to see. So, so then I became a psychiatrist eventually. Um, and um, I, I got a scholarship and I went to Harvard for a year and that was wonderful. And uh, then I came back and uh, I went on the staff of the University of Toronto. And um, I, was, I was very good at teaching. And so uh, the head of, of the teaching department, the director of education, wanted me to become his, his deputy, his assistant. And so, but in order to do that, he had to bring up my name to the board of directors. And as he told me later, he brought up my name and there were no objections, except one person who said, don't you think he's too young for this job? And then everybody agreed, yeah, yeah, I think he's a bit too young. Why don't we wait a few years? So when I heard that, I was very disappointed. And I thought to myself, this is, this is, no, this is no place for me. I, 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 I can't exist in this kind of a bureaucracy. And so after, after that one year at the university, I went into private practice. Okay, and that brings me then very closely now to pre and perinatal psychology. Because one of the things, of course, that I continued doing in private practice was to ask people about their dreams because I really enjoyed working along those lines. So one day I had a young man talking about his dream and suddenly he started, he started crying like a little baby. And so I left him alone and he did that for about 10 minutes. And then he came out of it, so to speak. And I asked him what happened. And he said that um, he just found himself in a little baby crib and he was crying for his mother. And then being a somewhat skeptical young lawyer, he said, you know, there's something wrong with this picture because I actually have seen photographs of myself as a baby and all of them were taken in a blue crib. So there's something doesn't make sense here. So I told him to go home. He was still a young man. His parents were alive. Speak to your mother. Come back. Tell me next week what she said. So he came back next week and he said, you know, this is really amazing, but it seems that the first few months of my life, my parents did not have enough money to buy me a crib. And I was lying in a borrowed crib from a neighbor. And that crib, my mother says, was white. And only two months later, they somehow scraped enough money together, bought me my own crib. That was the blue crib. That's the one that all the photographs were taken. <coughs> Excuse me. So. I thought about that and um, having been educated in some of the best universities 
in North America, University of Toronto, Harvard, um, I was made to believe that children before the age of two cannot remember anything. So I kind of put it on the back shelf, right? But then, interestingly enough, every couple of months, something like that happened. Um, and so I, I could tell you more, but anyway, let me just say that a few other such occasions happened to me. Other people started telling me about similar experiences because they knew I was interested in it. And so then I began to wonder whether sort of the accepted dictum of, uh, of neuroscience and psychology, the children before the age of two cannot remember anything was wrong. It was simply wrong. Um, and so I put together everything that I could find in the literature that would support the idea that children before the age of two could actually remember something. And I wrote a paper called The Psychic Life of the unborn child. And an obstetrician friend of mine told me that there was this big uh, psychosomatic obstetrics and gynecology conference in Rome happening in a few months. And why don't I submit a paper? And of course, by that time, I had gone to quite a few conferences, of course. And I knew that people who present papers are always treated much better than the regular attendees, right? So why not? Uh, so I sent in this paper and it was accepted. It was accepted. And so this is where luck comes in, okay? Um, the paper was accepted on its merits, but as luck would have it, I was put on the main speaker's presentation on the morning of, of, the, of the Congress. Okay, uh, speakers like R.D. Lang and Sheila Kitzinger and mm -hmm. many of the leading lights of psychosomatic obstetrics and gynecology were giving papers the same morning. So the attendance was huge, like there were 600 people there or something. And I was given 20 minutes. And so I presented everything that I could in 20 minutes, but I could immediately see that there was a lot of excitement in the audience, like they were really, really turned on by the information that I was putting across. Do you um, happen to remember the title, the theme of your talk? Yes, it is. The Psychic Life of the Unborn Child. Ah, okay, right. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. So um, then I noticed, like I said, I noticed this excitement. And I said at the end of my talk, uh, if you would like to continue this conversation, please come to my room, 2.34 at 5 o'clock, and uh, we can talk. And so at 5 o'clock, there was this big lineup of people in front of my door again. Uh, and R.D. Lang was there, and Sheila Kitzinger, and uh, oh, I mean, all kinds of really wonderful, interesting people. And so I made contact with those people. And so once having made contact with them, I began to think that there's a book in here. And so I should write a book on this. And so uh, I made a proposal for a book. Uh, I found a literary agent in New York who was willing, who was willing to um, represent me. She was a small, unknown literary agent. And um, then, you know, for the next two years, I wrote the book. And then uh, she passed it along to all the publishers in New York. And they were all incredibly excited about it. Okay. And it was the most exciting part of my life, really. It was. It was, it was amazing. Um, and so I went to New York for two days and um, every hour on the hour, I would have an interview with Simon and Schuster and Collins and Viking. And, and uh, essentially, you know, this is like 1980, 1980, I think. Um, 
So um, really the focus was, can I present this on television? Essentially, you know, are you a television person? Okay. And they thought that I was. And so then after two days, uh, they, they, there was a, a bidding war on the book. And I would get these phone calls from my literary agent. You know, we have $20,000 from Simon & Schuster. Should we accept it? I said, no, keep on going. So it was very, it was very exciting. And then finally, Simon & Schuster bought the book. Uh, and then they changed. They thought that psychic sounded too much like ESP, extrasensory perception, a little bit to California. So uh, they changed it to the secret life of the unborn child. And so then when the secret life of the unborn child came out at that time, once again, you know, publishers had a lot of money. It's not like it is today, as you well know. Um, and so they sent me across the country, you know, for television and media interviews. And then in the course of that, I met David Chamberlain in, uh, Los, in Los Angeles. Um, I was in Hollywood doing all kinds of shows, and uh, he came to one of the tapings, and we met. And so then um, a year later, uh, David, David said he was a psychologist, and he said, why don't we make a presentation at the annual Psych Psychologist Association? And I said, fine. So we wrote an abstract. We wrote a paper together. We submitted it to the uh, American Psychological Association. And of course it was rejected. And so then in a moment of, I don't know, optimism, uh, I said to David, well, if they don't want us, let's start our own association. And he said, okay, <laughs> so, I started organizing the first International Congress on Pre- and Perinatal Psychology in Toronto. At that time, we did not have computers. It was all done by hand by my secretary, my, my office secretary, because I was still a practicing psychiatrist, a very busy office. And so um, I paid for it all from my own, from my own funds and started writing letters to people all across the world and inviting them to this first meeting. And um, it, was, it was a huge success. People came from all over the world. It was wonderful. Um, and um, and it, so at the, end of the, at the end of the meeting, a few people, including David Chamberlain and my wife, Sandra Collier and some other people, we got together and we founded the Pre- and Perinatal Psychology Association of North America. I wanted to call it the Pre- and Perinatal Psychology Association of North America because there was already ISPP in, German, in, in mostly German-speaking countries, Switzerland, Germany, Austria. So they were the International Study Society for prenatal psychology. That's what they were called at that time. So I wanted to differentiate it from the German association. So I called it North America. And then eventually it, it, it became um, APA, Association for Pre- and Perinatal Psychology and Health. Thomas, just to put it in time, uh, uh, the first time you founded uh, the association, which year was it? Okay. Um, that was in 1983. And how many mod uh, changes in uh, the name or the structure happened until it became APA? Uh, I don't know. It, they, they, there was only one change. It went oh, okay. from went from um, um, I, uh, what was it? Association for Pre- and Perinatal Psychology of North America uh, to uh, APA uh, sometime around 1990, somewhere around there. 1990, okay. Yeah. And were you already in cooperation, collaboration with uh, the 
ISP the German section? Uh, we were we were always on friendly terms. Um, mm -hmm. I th there was no formal collaboration. Um, Peter Foto Freiburg, who was who was uh, president for a long while, uh, it turns out that he and I were childhood friends. He oh. also from Bratislava. He died last year. Yes, unfortunately. And so it turned out I did not remember him, but he remembered me. Uh, and uh, so we were childhood friends, and then he became president of the uh, ISPP, uh, and uh, I was president of uh, of APA. <coughs> Sorry. So we had we had a very good close relationship, but uh, we we never sort of uh, we never entered any kinds of formal agreement, and we did not have. Uh, you know, like congresses together or jointly in any way. The the way you are trying to do it now is the global congress in Athens. Yeah. yeah so we we kept it simple, uh, respectfully. You know, we respected each other, and they had their own journal, and I started our journal uh, in nineteen eighty six, and yes. that I went to New York, and. Uh, I found a press that was willing to publish our paper. And so we started our journal in 1986 and we have been going ever since. So this is 19, this is 2022. So that's 14 and 22. So that's 36 years now we have had our journal. Yeah. Yeah, a whole library. Yes, yes, there's a lot of, there's a lot of information there. Yeah. yeah. So, so then, uh, you know, I was, uh, I was uh, president uh, of uh, of APA for a long time until 1991. Uh, so for eight years, I guess, from '83 to 1991. Yeah, and then I continued on the board for many years, and uh, I went back to becoming editor of the pre and perinatal psychology journal. Uh, when they really, really needed someone because the other editor retired. And then uh, we found an editor uh, a few years after that. And so now I have continued as associate editor and we have an editor in chief who is very, very good. Good. So Thomas, welcome back to this point. But going back a little bit more and uh, around uh, the first uh, years of your life, uh, what was the name of your father? Eugene. U G U G E N E. Eugene. Eugene. Okay. And your mom? Uh, Mom's name? Gertrude. Gertrude. Right. So uh, let's uh, see your mom or your dad, your choice, uh, what kind of person uh, was uh, this uh, parent, uh, your mom or your dad? Well, my father was, was an incredibly good student. Mm. Um, when he was studying law, he stood first in his class every year. Um, when he graduated, uh, he was supposed to receive uh, the gold medal, but I think he graduated late in the 1920s and uh, they would not give, the university in Bratislava would not give a gold medal to a Jewish student. But instead, because it was a liberal democracy, you know, pretty good for its day actually, uh, they sent him to the Sorbonne for six months. Mm -hmm. uh, he, 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 he was an incredible brain. Uh, he, he, he could speak um, German, Slovak, Hungarian, a little bit of Russian, a little bit of Polish. He learned English very, very quickly. Uh, he was very, very bright. Uh, he was very well liked. He was a very good lawyer. Uh, he was very involved in politics. Um, pretty well every evening we would be discussing politics when I lived at home. Um, 
And I really miss that. I really miss having people who are well-informed uh, to talk to because there are not too many of those people around here. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the problem of uh, being so uh, good and at the same time lonely. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he was, he was, he was brilliant. Uh, and my mother was totally different. Uh, she was not brilliant, uh, but she was a good woman, a kind woman, uh, a very loving woman. Uh, so it was, it was a, it, it was a good marriage, and uh, they were good parents. Uh, from the part of your of your father, uh, was it like that in uh, your grandfather's? On the paternal side, was there information like this in the other ancestors? Well, um, my mother's my mother's father uh, owned the first printing press in Bratislava, ah. and so he was very well um, respected. And uh, but he was he was a he was kind of a Victorian figure, you know, very authoritarian. Mm -hmm. And uh, he uh, he believed that because he was so well known and so important that nothing would happen to him and his family. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, he was wrong. And. Um, he, he was able to stay in Bratislava until almost the very end, but uh, the Germans put him on the last, him and my grandmother in the last transport to Auschwitz. And um, he was killed there the first day that he arrived. Oh. Yeah, so that was very, very sad. He was a wonderful person. I was very close to him, very, very close to him. Yeah. And on my father's side, his father, uh, owned a factory uh, out in the eastern part of um, of Slovakia, and uh, they fled into the mountains, uh, into the Tatra Mountains during the war, and they survived the war. Uh, but when he came down from the mountains, he developed a hernia, and uh, there was not sufficient uh, health care at that time, and he and he died right after the war. My grandmother on my father's side, his mother survived and eventually she went to live in England. So there, there is a lot of movement. Yes. There is a lot of work. There is a lot of appreciation of uh, service, of offering service to the, to the world. Or uh, there is a connection with the, the letters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for books, uh, oh, and yeah, uh, yeah and uh, the community. Speaking about your lawyer father, mm -hmm. and the politics. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, what do you think? Uh, uh, you have uh, integrated uh, in your own being as a value or values or skills uh, and how do you think this has uh, supported you in becoming who you have become well um, i think that that is very true um, that uh, my my father of course who had the biggest influence on my life because he was a very strong um, strong person um he was always very community conscious he always uh, he, he he was always involved in all kinds of community organizations um i belonged to um to um youth groups uh that were very much zionistic and involved in uh, in um building uh, a new homeland for Jews in, uh, in what was then Palestine. So um, it was sort of the equivalent to scouts, but with a Jewish emphasis. And so uh, 
and my father was always very uh very caring about poor people and dispossessed people and of course you know being dispossessed myself mm -hmm. uh, i have um uh, I have a great deal of um, of feeling uh, for other people who have suffered, like what's happening in Ukraine, for example, at the moment, right? So um, I think one of the advantages of of being a minority or belonging to a minority is that you have much more empathy for people who are in some ways persecuted or at least discriminated against. So, um, and also being, being an outsider to some extent, um, it's easier to question uh, prevalent norms. So, you know, when, when one of my patients, you know, had a memory, let's say, going back before birth, uh, it's easier for me to say, well, perhaps what I've been taught is wrong. Whereas a person who belongs to the majority just accepts it and is less likely, it's not impossible, but is less likely to question um, the norms that they have been taught to accept. So I think that that's pretty, uh, pretty common um, among. Um, so-called outsiders, whatever the reason may be, it does not have to be religious, could be anything. Um, but it's often sort of the people who are outsiders who make changes in society, not the insiders. Yeah. Big truth, big truth. Yeah, yeah, because you see things differently and you question and you're not afraid to question. And uh, so, and also because you're not easily accepted, you have to try a little bit harder. Yeah. So, um, you know, um, you, you, you try, I try, uh, certainly harder, um, because there is always, there are always these barriers that have to be overcome. Yeah. It's a, a little bit of uh, the challenge that you turn Mm. into an opportunity and actually then it becomes the next stage of evolution. Yeah, that's right. I mean, these are kind the kinds of problems that, for example, you know, a person like Ludwig Janus, right, would not have not have come across, right? His path would have been a lot easier than my path. Well, actually, it was full of challenges, uh, which uh, actually... When you hear this, this is very interesting to discover. Uh, war is always a war. And yeah. the, there are always victims, no matter which side you are. That's right. That's right. Yeah, they're always victims. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, you know, everybody's problems are the worst problems in the world, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you cannot measure my pain against your pain or somebody else's pain. Pain is pain. And like you said, war is war. And victims are all over the place. And uh, so, you know, it's what you, it's what you make of it, I guess. Right. Yeah. And it takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of energy. Yeah, it takes a lot of energy. And thank goodness I've always had a lot of energy. And I still have. So, so far, so good. <laughs> yes, yes. Were there any siblings, uh, Thomas? No, oh, thank goodness, no. Uh, I say thank goodness, no, because I think that surviving during the war would have been a lot, lot harder had there been two of us instead of just me. Yes. So, uh, thank goodness, no, there were no siblings. And my mother had one sister. My father had two sisters, and um, they all had their own stories of survival, but they all survived. It, it's my grandparents and other relatives who perished during the war. Right. So, Thomas, you said that uh, there was a time when uh, you did not have a, an idea where your parents were. 
That's correct. What had happened? What was their story? Oh, my, well, it was very, very complicated. Um, my father, of course, was a uh, military age. Mm. So for him to be on the street without a uniform was a problem. Uh, because uh, the military police could stop him anytime and ask him for his identification papers. And why is he not in the military? Is he on leave? If so, where are your papers, you know? And at the same time, of course, he had to pretend every morning that he's going to work where they were living in order not to raise suspicion, right? So every morning he would get up and he would go to uh, any of the libraries, public libraries in Budapest, and that's where he would hang out. But there were many a days where he would have like a couple of pieces of bread and for, for a meal, and that's it. Like they had no money, they had no income. I mean, imagine, imagine you uh, and your husband, is, is your husband still alive, if I may ask? Uh, I'm divorced. Okay, now you, you were married to a judge, I think. Lawyer. Lawyer, okay. Uh, so, okay, so imagine, imagine that you by yourself, you know, uh, suddenly went to uh, live, I don't know, in Paris, right? And you didn't, and you didn't know anybody and you couldn't get a job because you didn't have the right papers. How would you survive? So my mother was luckier in a sense. Uh, she came to uh, this market nanny where I was staying, who was, like I said, a very simple dressmaker. Uh, essentially, you know, she would just, just make changes to dresses, you know, shorten them, lengthen them, simple things like that. And she would be sort of a girl for everything, kind of, you know, like go fetch a cup of coffee, that kind of stuff. I mean, so Margit Nani then uh, gave, her, gave her lunch and then any food that was left in the evening, she would take home to my father. And, that's, and then my grandfather, once in a while from, from Bratislava, would send a carpet or some jewelry down to Budapest and then they would sell it and then they would have a little bit of money. And then they also gave money to Margit Nani to look after me. Just tiny bits, you know, whatever they had. So, um, and, and, you know, they, I mean, they were in constant danger because at any moment, you know, the police or the military police or the Nazis could stop them and ask for identification papers. They had false papers, uh, but they would not stand up to very close scrutiny, you know. So um, they, they spent three years, 42 to 45, in constant danger. And what is amazing is that my mother lived 202 here in Canada, you know. So it's amazing because, I mean, you know, I write a lot about stress and the effect that it has on people and children. And that's all true. And it's all documented. But at the same time, you know, there are people who are resistant. And thank goodness, my mother was one of them. My father died at 83 of cancer. Um, but uh, my mother lived to 102, and she was like fully conscious, like not, not an ounce of Alzheimer's or anything like that. Yeah. So I have some. Very resilient, a good example of resilience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hard yeah. work, smart, resilient. And Thomas, you spoke already about this beautiful lady in your very early childhood, who uh, was an angel protecting yes. you. Were there more people uh, later on, who inspired all this good in you, this potentiality in you, so that uh, it became, it, it could become actuality. Well, no, nobody as saintly as as her, and uh, I mean, she was one of a kind. She was 
uh, I mean, this incredibly, I don't know how to, how to call it, you know, I mean, she put herself into, incre she put herself and her family in incredible danger by taking care of me and, and my mother to some point, right? So, I mean, how many people would do that today? You know, I, I, I'm not sure how I would act under those circumstances. None of us know until it happens, right? But I mean, this woman did, and six months after the war, she died of cancer. Um, what a pity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What a loss. Yeah. Tremendous loss. Um, so anyway, um, in terms of your question, no, I don't think that I ever had the good fortune of, um, of meeting someone who was quite so outstanding. Uh, but I certainly have met during my university career and later on um, people in positions of influence uh, who sort of adopted me and took me under their wings. And um, I benefited from that greatly. Um, again, but that was more of a mute. Um, it was more of a mutual relationship rather than sort of, you know, like Margaret Nanny who took care of me. And I mean, you know, I really didn't give her anything in return except my love and affection. Um, but like in my university years, I would seek out, I would actively seek out people who I admired and I would go to them and I would say, would you mentor me? You know, would you, would, could we meet once a month and talk about psychology or this or that? So I would actively seek out people and, uh, and, and some of them, you know, uh, then responded well, and some of them didn't, uh, but enough people responded well uh, that I have um, benefited from that. And I have established some good relationships all over the world with people. Um, and so I've been very fortunate. Actually, what I hear, Thomas, is that uh, you made your own path, your own, you are self-taught in quotation mark, starting from the moment when you started reading Freud's book about uh, the interpretation of dreams. Yes, yes, this is true. This is true. Yeah, yeah, uh, I, I have, um, I have exerted, you know, some conscious um, influence on my life. Mm -hmm. And this also speaks about humility, because to uh, go and uh, ask a person, can you become a mentor, is at the same time a moment of humility in you saying, I want to learn from you, yes. recognizing this thirst for mm -hmm. uh, adding something which is of value yes yes yeah i think that you know i have had that kind of personality that when i see something that i want i mean i recognize something that is worthwhile and then i go after it mm. and uh, try to um, make it happen you know um, I mean, my next project, for example, is that I will be starting a podcast. Yes. And uh, that has been very difficult. And sometimes I regret the idea that I ever wanted to do that because there are all kinds of technical problems, you know. Um, but I'm gradually overcoming them. And um, so, you know, it's just something that I wanted to do because it gives me a chance to meet some interesting people. And uh, that sort of keeps me alive, you know, keeps my mind alive. And uh, also I'm a chess player. I don't know whether you knew, that, right? So I, I, I love playing chess and meet some interesting people 
doing that. And uh, then, of course, you know, writing books and writing articles and lecturing. I'm going to Japan in October and uh, doing some lectures there and hoping to promote pre and perinatal psychology in, in Japan. And a couple of years ago, I went to India and did the same thing. And so that's happening. So, um, you know, I, I try to do as much good as I can for as long as I can. Yeah. When you find something good, share it with all you can, you can get close to. That's what you're doing. Yes. Yes. And so are you. So yes. Are, yes, yes, yes. So we are two, two, two of a kind in that sense. Yeah, actually, I can recognize a lot that I have done or I'm doing as you speak, but to a very much smaller level. But I also so much enjoy meeting interesting people, learning from them, reading their books or, um, you know, in conversation with these uh, intelligent minds and uh, hearts. Right, right, right. And that keeps you alive, um, yeah. intellectually and, and physically, both. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Good. So, um, how many books have you written so far? Eight. Eight. Eight books, uh, one book of poetry. Yeah, you have the poet in you as well. And you do stories for children as well. Yes. Uh, uh, so one book of poetry, and then I think two or three books that I edited. And then the rest are, uh, and then the rest are all about pre and perinatal psychology, essentially. And my new book, The Embodied Mind, uh, goes beyond pre and perinatal psychology. So it's it really... You know, it's it's it's. I have always been, I've always been uncomfortable about memories that go back beyond uh, the first six months of intrauterine life. Because, um, science is important to me. I've always tried to present the best possible hard scientific view instead of just you know stories, and um, so. The science is there, has, has been there for a long time to support some kind of a memory, memories being laid down at the end of the second trimester. But there was no science to show that you could actually go back further, that you could go back to conception, and that perhaps even how your parents felt and some of their experiences may be passed on to your children. So that always bothered me. And then, um, Seven years ago, I came across this paper on a on, on a 44-year-old Frenchman uh, who went to see his doctor because he had uh, a weakness in his left leg. And then, well, you, you, read, you read about this in my book that you are editing. Um, but anyway, so I read about that. And then it turns out that they did some lab tests and they found out that the man has actually no brain except for a very thin crust of brain tissue. The rest of his skull is full of fluid. We call it hydrocephalus. So when I read that, you know, it was a little bit like the patient that I told you about many, many years ago who had this dream about being in a crib. A kind of light bulb went up in my head. And I said to myself, how is this possible? This doesn't make any sense. How can a person at 44 years old, a civil servant, father of two, married man, continue living without a brain? Not, I mean, virtually no brain. So that's what then got me, just like the story about the young man in the crib, it got me on this path to look, to look into this. And so that's when I discovered, you know, cellular intelligence that really all the cells in our bodies working together uh, can provide us with a memory system that is kind of a backup to the memory system in the brain 
and the two of them work together. So for a long time, you know, there has been this huge emphasis on the brain. Everything is about the head, who is the head of government, you know, all that kind of stuff. And what I'm advocating for in my new book, The Embodied, the Embodied Mind, is a more balanced view that, yes, the head is important, but so is the body, and top down and bottom up are important. Essentially, that's what this book is about. Yeah, we'll soon see it in Greek as well, hopefully uh, in the next few months, uh, not uh, too long. So, uh, as you have uh, devoted a lifetime to this, what are the most important lessons, messages that you would like to, to share or to send to uh, the professionals today? Hmm. Well, um, first of all, in terms of, you know, in terms of children and especially young children, you know, uh, they are a lot smarter uh, than you give them credit for. And that everything that you say in front of a child from the moment that he or she is born uh, may have an impact on him or her. So, you know, saying nasty things like, you know, what's wrong with her head or something like that could have lifelong impacts. So be aware of that, okay? Children are not, you know, not these little blobs of protoplasm. Uh, they are thinking, feeling human beings. So treat them with that kind of respect. Um, in terms of future parents, I think, you know, anybody who is thinking of, uh, of, of forming a family, having children, I think it's very important to be careful as to how you live your life uh, in terms of health, you know, smoking, uh, taking drugs, uh, exercising, um, avoid, you know, stressful situations before you conceive a child, because all the things that you do may have an impact on the future child. And then, of course, you have your nine months of pregnancy, which are incredibly important. And um, you have to realize, speaking to these parents, you have to realize that um, there is a tiny little human being being constructed inside your body. And again, you know, you have to respect that. And you have to take that into consideration, you know, so like, don't, you know, don't go to some kind of a, some kind of a rally uh, in front of the White House or something, you know, where there might be violence, because this may have an effect on your child. And then, of course, you know, when we are looking at the situation, let's say, in Ukraine or any other war ravaged places, uh, I mean, this, these kinds of ideas become very, very significant, and trying to shield uh, the child in the womb from what's going on outside becomes becomes a huge challenge, um, and and we we just have to do what we can. I mean, obviously, you know, you can't stop the bombing, um, but you can perhaps control your reactions to it, and especially if you can surround yourself by loving people, that will make a difference. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. So um, I think that's that's important. <clears throat> I think I think it's very important to be kind to people um, because I mean, in the long run, it's really the only thing that really counts is is love and kindness, and uh, everything else becomes secondary. So um, I think that being, being kind to everybody that you can be kind to, not to be hostile, not to be aggressive, um, will make a better world. And the researchers? Research? 
Yes, to the, what, what would the, your message be to the researchers, the academia? Well, yeah, okay, uh, academia, you, you have to, you know, coming back to the embodied mind, I think, uh, you know, you have, to, you have to realize that many of the conditions that you think are in the head are really in the rest of the body. Uh, you know, for example, you know, um, let's say Alzheimer's is a disease uh, mostly of plaques, amyloid plaques in the brain. Uh, but just recently it has been found uh, that these amyloid plaques are made in the liver. Mm. liver. And so rather than trying to treat the head, the head, the head all the time, the brain, uh, look at the rest of the body. Uh, and so another, another example, speaking of plaques, is atherosclerotic plaques, plaques in arteries. Again, that has for a long time been considered a disease of, uh, in, of inflammation and cholesterol and fat and all that kind of stuff. But actually, it turns out that because it is it is a disease, an inflammation of the arteries in certain spots. Uh, nervous, nervous signals are sent to the brain. And when the brain receives these signals from the diseased arteries, it sends out signals of stress to the rest of the body. And so that those stress signals go back to the atherosclerotic plaques uh, this disease, uh, this study, for example, was just published recently from Munich, from, from in Germany, University of Munich, and those stress signals uh, make the plaques even worse, so they grow even faster. So interrupting the stress signals instead of treating the plaques on their own, and interrupting the stress signals from the brain would make a big difference. So looking at the whole body. Uh, is incredibly important for researchers and take their eyes off the brain, which is where it is so much of the time and start looking at other things that are happening. And I can give you many other examples of other things that are happening in the body and how that affects the brain and vice versa. So look at the bilateral communication between the brain and the body, the body and the brain. So that's where I would like researchers to go. Great. And politicians, the decision makers? I think that what is wrong with certainly the politicians in this country and the United States and I don't think it's very much different in the rest of the world is that their main purpose is to be reelected. Yeah. They serve the people, unfortunately. Uh, they talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. It's yes. all promises, but they don't deliver. Um, it would be nice if politicians actually were less concerned with being reelected and all the wonderful things that come with being in parliament or being a minister of justice or whatever it is, you know, all, 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 all the limousines and all that kind of stuff that comes with uh, being elected. Uh, and if they actually, you know, try to make some changes like in health, for example, you know, um, there is so much that can be done in health and education that is not being done. And so much is spent on armaments instead of an armaments and roads and all kinds of, you know, bells and whistles instead of, you know, health and education. Because we know that education makes a huge difference. And, and also it's very important to have... Uh, to have open media, you know, no censorship of media. Yes. And supporting, supporting journalists to do their work instead of controlling them and censoring what they say. Uh, so in terms of politicians, you know, uh, health and particularly the health of pregnant women and uh, giving 
pregnancy classes, for example, very, very important, right? Uh, preconception classes would be wonderful if they existed. I don't think they exist anywhere in the world, um, but I think that would be highly, highly uh, desirable. So yeah, there's a lot of work to be done. Great. And Thomas, what would life be like if you were not born? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Um, I suppose it would be the same as always. Um, perhaps somebody else would come up with the same ideas. I don't know. Um, Perhaps they would come up with, a, with better ideas. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't think that I am that unique. Uh, just a hardworking guy with some fresh ideas. Yeah. Well, um, you have never stopped the better idea from appearing, that's for sure. But uh, we would have missed a lot. Perhaps, perhaps it would be nice to think that, but I, I have never entertained that thought actually. Yeah, it's just a, um, a hymn to the life we have lived. We have uh, um, made the best use of. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a question uh, to my understanding of honoring the moments we have uh, uh, experienced. Yeah. So, is uh, there anything you would like to add to this uh, conversation we had before bringing it to a good closure? Well, thank you for asking. Um, I can't think of anything right now to add. I think that we have had a very interesting and moving conversation actually brought up a lot of feelings in me uh, talking about my past. Um, I think it's just so important in terms of the work that both you and I have been doing for many years in terms of pre and perinatal psychology. I think it's just so important to emphasize um, motherhood and and to emphasize positive parenthood. Uh, motherhood has to, take, has to take place, you know, preferably in a relationship with another loving person, um, preferably the father of that child, as far as I'm concerned, but whatever the loving relationship may be. But also we need social supports for that. So, you know, when you ask about politicians, that, you know, that is, again, one of the things that... Um, they are trying to do in Japan right now very, uh, uh, very well. And uh, it's one of the reasons I'm going to Japan in October is to support uh, their outreach to government and uh, to emphasize how scientifically supported uh, these ideas are, okay? They are not, they are not just sort of wishes, they're not just dreams. Uh, this is all anchored in good, solid research. And uh, that's, so I think that we need to put that information out to the governments all over the world um, that, you know, parenthood, that unless you have a good nine months in the womb and a good early beginning and a good childhood, you are not going to have good people in this world. That, you know, caring about the environment, becoming a peaceful instead of an aggressive, hostile person has to start at conception. So there can be no world peace without a peaceful womb. That's my message. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. It was a pleasure. Talk to you soon.